Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of lectures designed to give you some background in MRI systems, image acquisition, and uh, safety in general. I'll be presenting a series of four lectures uh, over the next two weeks that cover the basic background information you need to understand how MRI systems work and how images are formed. Um, I'm Daniel Ennis. I'm in the Department of Radiology, uh, and I work there as an MR scientist and uh, uh, work with a group of scientists that help develop new and novel methods for cardiovascular MRI in particular, but other applications as well. Um, my lectures will be about two hours long, and uh, I'm happy to take questions uh, throughout. Uh, in fact, we'll take some small uh, breaks, if you will, during the lecture to go through some true-false kinds of questions. And you'll also see quickly some learning objectives that I've uh, added in throughout the talk so that as you review the material, you can understand what I think is important uh, conceptually and use that as a guide for studying the material further. We will make uh, the lecture videos available online and also the slides as well. And you have a handout on which you can make notes and stay coordinated with me as I work through the material. So with that in mind, I'll go ahead and get underway with today's lecture, which again focuses here on MRI systems and safety related to those systems. One of the first questions we should ask ourselves really is what is MRI? And the magnetic part of MRI indicates that we need a really big magnet. And it will become clearer as this lecture progresses uh, what, we meet, what we mean by a really big magnet. Uh, MRI also takes advantage of a so-called resonance phenomena. And resonance here means that we need excitation energy that is on resonance with the system of in interest. Uh, in our case, this is the hydrogen nucleus of water molecules, or principally water molecules, and that energy has to have a very specific frequency such that it's on resonance with the frequency of protons. And lastly, uh, MRI is imaging, and therefore it means we can make pretty pictures. Now, it's not only uh, used for making pictures. There are other uh, techniques like spectro spectroscopic techniques that give us uh, uh, biochemical information as well. Uh, but as it regards radiology, uh, MR is mostly used for imaging. Uh, further considering what is MRI, we understand that MRI follows a classic excitation reception paradigm. And what this means is that excitation energy, which has to be on resonance and is generated through what we call a radio frequency pulse, sometimes called a B1 pulse, that energy excites the system in general, meaning it, it induces uh, a transition into the state of the uh, hydrogen nucleus, dipoles and uh, enables us to receive information back out of the body, for example, uh, and that information is in fact encoded with spatial information so that we can form pixels in an image and also contrast information so that we can distinguish amongst different tissue types. The excitation pulse itself here is shown as some time varying pulse as a function of time and it helps lead to the formation of a so-called free induction decay shown here, or alternately an echo, which we'll talk about later. We get energy back out of the system. It sort of echoes back out of the system. And the signals that we receive after excitation are these high frequency oscillating signals that also decay. And we'll talk about their frequency and we'll talk about their decay uh, in this lecture and subsequent lectures as well. And one of the principles that underlies our ability to do MRI in the first place is Faraday's law of induction. Faraday's law of induction indicates that a time-varying magnetic field uh, will induce a current in a nearby loop of wire. And so we can see as this magnet is moved back and forth relative to this loop or this coil, uh, we can see that a voltage is induced, and that's something that can be measured and recorded by uh, computer equipment. Now, the source of this time-varying magnetic field in magnetic resonance imaging is actually the magnetic dipoles of the hydrogen nucleus in the water and other tissues of our body. And so, believe it or not, hydrogen nuclei in water behave like tiny little magnets and can induce currents in nearby coils via Faraday's law of induction. So this principle becomes critical 
uh, to how MRI functions in a modern scanner. One of the fascinating and albeit arguably very difficult things about MR is understanding how MR encodes spatial information and image contrast into the echo. And this will take shape in the subsequent lectures. Uh, we'll only touch on it briefly today. There are several requirements for an MRI exam, and we'll briefly go through these and then dig into this more in depth throughout the rest of this lecture. The first thing we need is a so-called NMR active nuclei. Not all uh, atomic species, or elements rather, are subject to the NMR phenomena, uh, but fortunately hydrogen, or H1, which is found in water, and our bodies are mostly water, is, is in fact NMR active. There are other nuclei that are NMR active as well, and we'll discuss that briefly a little bit later. One of the key hardware components that we need is this B0 uh, magnetic field, that strong magnetic field that most people associate with MRI, uh, this 1.5 Tesla or even 3 Tesla field, um, which we in this course will refer to as the polarizer. It's what makes available bulk magnetization in an organized fashion that's amenable then to subsequent Im imaging after excitation with an RF pulse. You'll remember already uh, that the RF system, or the B1 system, is the exciter. And you'll notice also that B here really refers to magnetic field. Uh, B0 is a static homogeneous magnetic field. Again, that's something like 1 and a half, 4, 3 Tesla. The B1 system, as you'll see later, is time varying and very, very small in amplitude but it's critical to exciting the spin system uh, such that we can actually encode and capture information about the underlying tissues. We also have seen already uh, in the Faraday's Law of Induction slide that we need a coil or a loop of wire to lie nearby the anatomy of interest so that we can receive the system, uh, the, the, the signal rather, out of the body. Having excited the spins, we now want to receive information back out of the spin system that's encoded with both spatial information and contrast information. We also need gradients. Uh, these are also uh, magnetic fields that vary over space. We refer to them in different directions, the X, the Y, and the Z gradients. And the critical importance for the gradients is that they uh, enable so-called spatial encoding. And by spatial encoding, we really just mean imaging. We're able to localize uh, signals to specific parts of the body and thereby form uh, a useful diagnostic image. And one of the last things we need, of course, are a number of different computers. Uh, and the most important role that these computers play is not only in data acquisition, but also in image reconstruction. Right, we're talking about the cardiac MR setup. Uh, I think you understand the basics here. In the background here, this is the main field. And inside this whole you know, cabinet, if you will, that's the gradient system and the RF system, all of the main uh, components that we have just talked about and we'll see uh, a little bit more later. Uh, oftentimes we need earplugs and headphones to protect the patient's hearing and to provide a way for two-way communication. Uh, we may use things like ECG pads or even a bellows so we can synchronize imaging to the cardiac cycle or synchronize imaging to the respiratory cycle. And then of course we might use contrast agents and injectors uh, to administer those agents. Uh, and the consequence of course, or one of the really uh, advantageous things of MR is that we can acquire these arbitrary imaging planes, which we'll talk about more uh, later as well, but we can do lots of neat imaging things, right? So let's look at a teardown of what's inside the tube or the magnet that you climb inside or uh, when you're placed on a table, the table slides inside. And there's a bunch of components here, but to begin with, we'll just start with these two. The first one is what we call the main coil. So winding around the outside of this tube, if you will, is a bunch of superconducting wire uh, that carries a high current and that current what, is what generates this main B0 field, which we'll talk about uh, in the next handful of slides. And surrounding that main B0, uh, uh, those coils or those windings of wire, uh, is a bunch of liquid uh, um, uh, helium. And that liquid helium is held inside of a cryostat. A cryostat is a big kind of metal tank, and it keeps everything at superconducting temperatures. And I'll explain why that's important in a little bit. But just uh, sort of. Uh, as a teardown perspective, you want to identify maybe where these hardware components lie. And we'll talk about the other colored components as we move forward. Uh, so in the middle here is what we call the body transmit or, or transmit and receive. So transmit is TX, RX is receive. And this is responsible for generating the B1 field and doing the actual exciting. Uh, 
It's located near isocenter. Isocenter is what we call the middle of the magnet. You can think of it as sort of the zero, zero, zero coordinate, the middle uh, of the MR magnet. And that body coil is responsible for generating that RF pulse. It can be used for imaging, for receiving signals as well, but that's a less common application. And then the last thing we see here are the so-called X and Y and Z gradients. And the X, Y, and Z gradients were responsible for what? Do you remember? Spatial encoding, right? That's the, the one key thing you want to remember. Okay, so MR advantages and disadvantages, lots of things, right? One of the main advantages, of course, is soft tissue contrast, right? Uh, there's an, a, a, a innumerable ways to actually manipulate image contrast in MR, and that's both a strength and a weakness in some regards. Uh, if we look closely here, we can obviously see that there are differences in the signal intensities that we get from muscle, fat, lung, liver, heart, blood, white matter, gray matter. And one of the really fascinating things about MR is here we can see some axial images uh, through the head. Uh, and just by changing some parameters, we'll talk about these parameters as we move for forward, just by changing some imaging parameters, we can get you know, significantly different image contrast, going from something that's relatively flat, this is a, in fact a proton density weighted image, to something that has a lot of, say, white matter, gray matter contrast. And how we go about doing that, we'll talk about later. Um, one of the things that's, that's emerging, and I think you guys will see as practicing radiologists moving forward, especially if you uh, do a lot of MR, is increasingly methods for quantitative tissue characterization. Right? How do we actually measure things about tissues? Not just present grayscale images that have diagnostic utility and differentiating sort of tissue types, but actually measuring things. And you might want to measure things for uh, uh, assessing disease progression or response to therapy. And I won't get into all the sort of technical ways that we go about doing that right now, but most methods people are working on ways to make them increasingly quantitative so that we can get T1 maps and T2 maps and get actual numbers and measures about the T1 or, or things that are more physiologic like perfusion or perhaps diffusion. Um, and so these are, I, I guess, in the top here, what I'm referring to are, are the more sort of conventional routine methods, uh, many of which you've probably seen in action already. And as the field progresses, I think you'll see more and more advanced methods where we're actually mapping, whereby we mean measuring things. We can also, uh, there are methods for estimating the fat fraction tissues. This can be really helpful in, say, liver disease, or the iron content, also helpful in, in liver and cardiac diseases. Uh, and I won't get into all these other methods, but there are a lot of so-called advanced methods for MR as well. Uh, another advantage here of MR is uh, the ability to acquire so-called arbitrary imaging planes. Uh, if you think about CT as one example, uh, we typically get a, you know, a high-resolution set of axial images, and we can digitally reformat that later. We can cut that up and slice it however we choose. With MR, the approach is slightly different, uh, where we target so-called ob uh, oblique slices or even doubly oblique slices, or of course axial sag sagittals, coronals, uh, as sort of as important for making a diagnosis. But we have this so-called flexibility of arbitrary imaging planes, and why that's the case, we'll get into when we talk more about the, the gradients, which are responsible for spatial uh, localization. This is what my my CT friends love this slide, right? Uh, and so uh, I, don't, I don't mean to overstate it, but uh, to, the, to the effect that it matters, there's no ionizing radiation used with MR, right? We could debate how important that is for CT applications and so forth, uh, but it still remains the case that at least for MR, we don't have uh, nor need to use ionizing radiation. Um, and one of the really neat things that uh, it really depends on the application, I suppose, but we uh, really like the applications of using MR to look at physiologic motion. Uh, this has sort of more clinical applications when it comes to cardiac motion, uh, but people are evaluating different ways in which so-called real-time imaging, where you can acquire images and reconstruct them in real time, could be used, for example, for developing new interventional techniques, being able to do liver biopsies in an MR scanner and see soft tissues as you're advancing a needle uh, or looking at bone nets or something like this. Okay, so of course anything that has advantages has disadvantages. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah, so I went, I went a little bit quickly there. So on the left-hand side here, these are real-time images. So they have a, a temporal footprint of maybe about 50 milliseconds. And I can just get a stream of images, one every 50 milliseconds. Uh, there's a lag to the reconstruction depending on exactly what's being done. So real-time means different things to different people. 
if you if you're an interventionalist, real time means acquire and reconstruct, right? Because I'm trying to do a procedure while looking at these images, and that's a that's a goal of MR. The ones on the right, the ones on the right are actually synchronized to the cardiac cycle through the use of an e of ECG gating. Um, we can do real time imaging for cardiac uh, applications if you want to look at a, say a patient with an arrhythmia. That's possible, but that's very sort of cutting edge and more research oriented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are played at sort of real time speeds or, or real life speeds. Yeah. Okay, so again, anything that has advantages is going to have disadvantages. So, what are the disadvantages? Well, amongst the principal disadvantages for MR are safety considerations, right? And so, we'll talk about these as we work our way through the different hardware components, but we're very conscientious of patient safety and staff safety in an MR environment. Um, another disadvantage is arguably that MR is slow. The rate at which we can acquire data is not as fast as it is for CT or ultrasound. Um, and so there's a huge amount of research effort spent on making MR faster and faster and faster and faster. And big advances there as well. It used to take 10 minutes to get a single spin echo image, one slice, you know, back in the, say, 80s. And now we can do that in seconds. So there are and have been huge advances here in the speed of, of, at which people can um, procure an MR exam. Uh, I think part of what's happened there is that as things have gotten faster and faster, they've just acquired more and more forms of contrast. So now you get T1s and T2s and proton densities and fat water separated, and let's do perfusion, and let's do contrast, enhance, and pre-contrast. And so your exam queue is, is, uh, is building uh, because we can acquire so much uh, image data so quickly. Um, it's an expensive imaging modality. We'll talk a little bit about that. And in some sense, it can be relatively nonspecific, right? It doesn't have the specificity that PET does, a radio tracer for a specific ligand, right? Uh, we have T1 changes for different reasons. We have T2 changes. Different physiologic processes can have the same impact on the image. Uh, and that makes your job a little trickier, right? Because it doesn't have this molecular specificity. And of course, it can be very technically challenging, right? These are, these are difficult machines to operate. Uh, there are a lot of free parameters, a lot of things that you can potentially change, uh, and that poses a, a, a challenge for the techs, and it poses a challenge for getting uh, routinely high-quality imaging exams. Um, one of the first things you'll do when a patient comes in, uh, there'll be a patient screening form. I won't go through this whole thing, but it just highlights that we have to inquire with the patient about their background medical history so we can infer or, or discover whether or not they have a potential contraindication for an MR exam. What kinds of devices do they have implanted? Do they have hip implants, pacemakers, aneurysm clips? And we really have to go through this stuff carefully to make a decision about whether this exam is safe for this patient or, in fact, uh, the benefit to risk ratio is not there. Uh, lots of ways to sort of get at uh, understanding contraindications. There is a, uh, something of an encyclopedia here that's printed every year by Frank Shellock that details sort of what's known about the safety of, of medical devices implanted in patients undergoing MR exams. And so if you have a patient with an IUD and you want to know, is that okay for MR, this is the book. You have a patient with uh, you know, some kind of catheter, uh, this is the book where you can go and figure out uh, if that's what's known at least about that particular device. Sometimes things are known and sometimes things are unknown. So lots of possible contraindications, and I won't go through this whole list. You can look at it later, but it kind of goes from high risk to low risk. So aneurysm clips, right, that might be ferromagnetic and twisted or pulled by that strong D0 magnet. Those are, uh, you know, an absolute contraindication for proceeding with an MR exam. Uh, on the bottom end here, you know, a body piercing or a hearing aid, they're not absolute contraindications. Hearing aids can generally be taken off. Even cochlear implants can be safe. Uh, and body piercings, for example, can be dealt with in different ways. So there's a, you know, you, you have to think carefully from sort of end to end about the possible risks of uh, what a patient has uh, when they uh, arrive for an exam. And they don't always know, right? They don't always know exactly what heart valve was implanted when they had their surgery. So sometimes there's a little sleuthing involved there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the first thing I would say is it's out of, a, out of an abundance of caution. People are just always very careful under those circumstances. The second reason is very little is known. Right? And so what, what are the possible concerns? Well, well, we'll talk about some of these things, but uh, uh, radio frequency energy, the energy we use to excite the spins, also causes bodies to heat up. 
and the ability of the fetus to tolerate additional heat dose is not well understood, right? Probably it's not a problem, but no one's going to get funding to do that experiment, right? Uh, another interesting or possibility is the MR system is quite loud. If you've had an MR exam before, you know it's a noisy piece of instrumentation. For the mother, we can provide hearing protection, earplugs, and headphones. For the fetus, we can't do anything. And so we don't know about the sound pressures that the, 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 that the developing fetus would see during an MR exam. So again, it's not an absolute contraindication. It depends on what the benefit is to the patient relative to these not well understood risks. So we image pregnant women pretty routinely here for sure, uh, but it just has to be considered. Um, important to think about MR safety uh, designations. There's real language that's used here, and this should, I'm not sure what happened to it, should have just a big MR in the middle of it, I think. Um, at one end of the scale, we think of how FDA describes a, a device. At one end of the scale, you can have uh, devices that are MR safe. The FDA says, no, that is safe. What does safe mean? Well, safe is a cotton blanket, right? There's just no reason you can't bring a cotton blanket or a pillow or things like that into the MR room. Those are going to be safe. At the other end of the spectrum, you have MR unsafe. What's MR unsafe? Uh, a ferromagnetic oxygen canister, right? Um, a tool belt that a paramedic is wearing that's got all kinds of things strapped to it that are ferromagnetic. So things that are going to fly into the scanner are certainly unsafe. And lots of implanted devices are unsafe. Not all. This is a, a really emerging landscape. But um, you, you have spinal cord stimulators and pacemakers that now have labeling that they are not, in fact, safe. And they are not unsafe, but they're so-called conditional. What does that mean? Well, there are pacemakers, for example, with MR conditional labeling. And that means you can scan a patient with that particular device if the exam meets certain conditions. Uh, I won't get into the details about that, but there's basically three tiers. Things are very safe, things are known to be unsafe, and then very narrow category of devices are known to be MR conditional. If the exam meets certain conditions, if it's acquired in a particular way, uh, the patient, according to FDA and the manufacturer, will be fine. Um, and the, I guess one point of this is that the term MRI compatible, that's not an FDA term. You're, you'll hear people ask that, oh, is that an MR compatible device? That's not a term that we actually use. Uh, that's sort of been cast out in, in favor of MR safe, MR conditional, and so-called MR unsafe. Uh, so what do we have to really worry about here? Well, one thing is B0. B0 is this really strong magnetic field. How strong is B0? You guys know? 1.5 Tesla, right? 3 Tesla. These are the terms we usually use to refer to a scanner. Oh, it's a 3T. Oh, it's a 1.5T. Uh, that's the that that refers to the strength of the B0 field and it's strong enough to you know to completely pull in you know very heavy many hundreds of pounds uh, emergency carts uh, if someone were to bring in the wrong piece of equipment uh, we also have to be very careful about oxygen canisters depends on the patient they may be on oxygen for different reasons only these canisters that look sort of silver and green are the MR can, uh, are the MR safe ones. They can be brought into the MR suite, and there's no uh, known problem. Unfortunately, there have been terrible accidents of people bringing in non or bringing in ferromagnetic oxygen canisters that they wheel it in, it it leaves their cart or leaves their hands very quickly, very forcefully, and flies into the scanner. And this is this terrible incident that's on the left there. Um, and so we have to remember, importantly, the B0 field, it's always on. It's very, very strong and always on. It will pull things. It'll pull your pocket knife, your keys, your glasses right off your face, no problem. Uh, it's strong enough to pull in much larger devices as well. Uh, and of course, if you go on the web, there's all kinds of um, disaster pictures of things that uh, people have dragged into scanners. Uh, so that's why if you, if you attend and work in the MR room, you usually have a pat down. You're taking out your wallet, you're taking out your keys, your phone, and anything loose that could uh, 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 form a projectile. Uh, the same thing applies to implanted devices. So here we have a stent. Uh, if that stent were made of a ferromagnetic material, uh, then the B0 field can exert a force or a torque on the implanted device and obviously pull it towards the main magnet. Um, most, uh, most modern implanted devices, uh, the manufacturers are aware of the need for MR uh, in patients, and so their choice of materials and the design of these devices is such that they're increasingly uh, MR safe and or MR conditional, um, but that's still something historically you have to be aware of, uh, and not all devices meet that 
the specifications. Um, last thing I'll comment on about B0 is the fact that we use cryogen gases. We use liquid, uh, liquid helium to cool this magnet, right? This is what keeps uh, this, these wires at what we call superconducting temperatures and enables us to generate very, very high magnetic fields. Well, there's the potential for that liquid helium uh, to, to, to get out of the magnet. There are vents for specific reasons, for safety reasons. They should vent gas out of the room, uh, out of the building, in fact. Uh, but because that liquid helium, of course, would be suffocating were it to fill an entire room, uh, we also have oxygen monitors. So every room will have an oxygen monitor. And if the oxygen partial pressure drops too low, then this thing will alarm. Uh, and they're pretty reliable. Sometimes they alarm uh, false alarms. Uh, but bottom line, we have to be conscientious that these cryogen gases, of which there are tens of thousands, you know, there's maybe 10,000 liters in, in sort of older magnets and much less in newer magnets, uh, that can boil off and potentially create a, a hazard uh, at the room level. Um, we talked about B0, now we're talking about B1. So we haven't talked too much about it, but we hopefully remember that, that the B1 field or the radio frequency fields are the things that we use for exciting spins. It's, what's, it's what gets the imaging experiment going in the first place. And these same RF pulses are associated with depositing energy in the body. Uh, and we measure that energy uh, in uh, using a term that we call the specific absorption rate. And the specific absorption rate, which is a rather strange name, uh, is measured in terms of watts per kilogram. So we can, according to FDA, uh, deposit, if you will, a certain number of watts per kilogram. We can heat patients up, we can heat people up a little bit, and that's okay. But of course, too much is not okay. Um, and so the bottom, probably the bottom line here to remember is that in so-called normal operating mode, if you just show up and try to use the scanner, you'll be limited to an MR exam that doesn't uh, uh, um, use more than two watts per kilogram or doesn't deposit more than two watts per kilogram in the patient. Why would the energy be high? Well, the energy uh, is higher depending on uh, the B1 strength, so higher and higher B1 fields. We'll talk about why we need that a little bit later. And it's also, it goes as the square of that, and it also goes as the square of the frequency. Uh, and we haven't talked about the Larmor frequency yet, but we're getting there in a second. Uh, so the bottom line is the radio frequency pulses we use heat up patients, and we're limited in terms of how much we can heat up patients. If you need to change your protocol such that it would heat up the patient more than 2 watts per kilogram, you can go into so-called first level mode. Uh, there'll be, you'll have to sort of accept this, you know, uh, working in this mode when you're on the scanner. And then you can go to 4 watts per kilogram. And so the bottom line is the scanner is sort of doing what it can to monitor or, or, or um, uh, me not exactly measure, but model how much energy is being deposited in the subject. And we have limits on that placed by the FDA. So the FDA limits the SAR. And this can in turn limit, for example, say the maximum flip angle or the amount of energy we use to uh, uh, generate an image in the first place. So really remember that RF energy can heat up patients and we have limits on that. Uh, what are the kinds of things that can happen? Well, it's possible to get small tissue burns uh, for different reasons. Uh, and it's also possible that for patients that have implanted devices, these implanted devices can heat up a lot as a consequence of the RF energy. Um, and so there's a lot of time and energy and effort spent in redesigning these devices so they don't heat up as much. Uh, that's not something we'll get into in, in real detail here, but we have to be conscientious of the potential for device heating as well as patient heating. Um, another consideration is uh, with regards, or another safety consideration is with regards to the gradients. So the gradients uh, are responsible for spatial localization, and they're the things that make the most noise when the MR scanner is running, right? Sort of buzzing and clicking a lot. Most of that noise is because of the gradients. And as a consequence of gradient noise, uh, there's a need for patients to wear earplugs and potentially headphones. Uh, we don't always use both, although I prefer to use both. And the headphones, of course, also provide a way for two-way communication. Um, the other possibility with the gradients, and we won't get into the details sort of why per se, but the gradients, uh, because they're switching magnetic fields, so gradients are magnetic fields that we turn on and off, and we turn them on and off quickly enough that you can actually potentially depolarize nerves. And the rate at which we turn gradients on and off is again regulated by FDA uh, because of this potential to depolarize nerves. And so right at the limits of how we operate the scanners, some patients will report a tingling sensation in their nose or in the low of their back, and that's borderline peripheral nerve stimulation. 
occasionally a patient will yelp and say, wow, what was that? Uh, statistically, these systems are designed so that 99% of patients are unaffected or something like this. So again, I guess the point here to remember is that these, these gradients, which are in fact time varying, they induce mechanical vibrations. That's what makes everything so loud. And they can uh, result in peripheral nerve stimulation, the sort of buzzing or tingling sensation uh, that patients can feel. <coughs> um, I won't talk a lot about contrast agents right now, but we do use exog exogenous contrast agents uh, in patients uh, for lots of different reasons, typically to increase the MR signal in areas where the contrast agent uh, perfuses to, so increases the signal in blood, perfused tissues, uh, tumors, for example. There are also contrast agents that can decrease the MR signal, for example, in lymph nodes. So there are different categories of contrast agents. Today, I won't spend a lot of time on contrast agents specifically. But of course, they all have contraindications, right? Things like hypotension, mild allergic reactions are probably the most common. Uh, a long time ago, not a long time ago, probably seven or eight years ago, there was um, uh, sort of a discovery that the so-called gadolinium-based agent. So gadolinium is a heavy metal that's used in most of the contrast agents that are used. Uh, it was previously associated with, I'm sorry if that got dropped off there. Uh, it was previously associated with NSF, uh, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, terrible disease. Um, and there was an unusual combination of poor renal function and, and specific gadolinium-based agents that were associated with a very small incidence of a very severe disease, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Now that the um, sort of that disease is, is more well understood, uh, we basically screen patients for kidney function, and if they have good kidney function, then they can get a gadolinium-based contrast agent. And as a consequence of putting that sort of uh, that sort of step in place, there's no newly reported cases of of NSF. So that's a good thing. Um, MRI is expensive, right? I talked about this some before. It's a few million dollars to buy a scanner, and it's going to cost you quite a bit of money to cite it, right? Real estate in Reagan is higher than Bel Air, right? And so it's expensive to put these systems uh, in, you know, where they belong, so to speak. It can be expensive to maintain, maybe $100,000 a year as a service contract so that you have high operational efficiency. Your scanner has a lot of uptime, which you want, because you're able to operate it and charge uh, depending on exactly what we're talking about, maybe $500 to even $1,000 an hour. So the operational cost is, is on the plus side for you. That's what you're able to charge uh, for a procuring MR exams as a consequence of the high-end technology and the need for a highly skilled radiologist to read the, uh, the exams as well. Uh, MR is also technically challenging, right? So we're talking about some of the disadvantages here. Why is it technically challenging? Well, there's a lot of scan parameters, and I won't get into all these today, but when you sit at the scanner, there's a lot of free parameters, a lot of things that you can change to adjust a, a scan. And, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that one bad move can lead to a pretty crummy image if you're not careful. Uh, there could potentially be physiologically, uh, physiological monitoring, ECG, respiration, blood pressure, things like that. Some patients in the hospital may be under general anesthesia or sedation, so just complicating factors that make the exam a little bit more difficult. Uh, we might require breath holding for abdominal and thoracic scans. Uh, we might be using contrast agents. We have to pick the right coil. There's just a lot of parts and pieces that can make an MR exam relatively complicated. Um, uh, and yet the diagnostic utility of the images, of course, outweighs all of these technical challenges, but these are things that people are working on to sort of simplify, if you will. Uh, and perhaps anatomic localization, you have to be pretty trained in order to get images of the right anatomy. Okay, so I've got, I've thrown in some, some test questions here, and then I also have some learning objectives we'll talk about in just a second. So let's start with this. Faraday's law of induction explains how spins produce a current in a coil. Yes. So Faraday's law of induction is that principle whereby we can acquire the, under, the underlying uh, signal. And the spins, the hydrogen nuclei, do produce or ultimately produce a current in some coil via induction. Okay, how about this? Gradients heat the patient and RF pulses cause peripheral nerve stimulation. I see a no. No, right? So gradients, do gradients heat the patient? What heats the patient? RF, right? Do RF pulses cause peripheral nerve stimulation? No. What causes PNS? The gradients. So it's just switched, right? Uh, gradients can dislodge and heat implanted devices. 
Not really, right? So the gradients, the, the B0 field could dislodge, right, a device, and the RF field is usually associated with heating implants. Uh, SAR limits. So SAR was the energy, uh, the watts per kilogram deposit in the patient. That can limit or constrain uh, scan parameters, yes or no? Yes, we can hit SAR limits, right? And in doing so, we have to make adjustments to our protocol. Okay, increasing the flip angle. We only talked about this a little bit, but increasing the flip angle is, is higher and higher B1, more radio frequency energy, or decreasing the TR. The TR is how quickly we play RF pulses. We can play it every five milliseconds, every 10 milliseconds, and that's the TR. So increasing the flip angle or decreasing the TR helps reduce patient heating? Not quite, right? If we increase the flip angle, we're going to increase patient heating. If we decrease the TR, sort of the rate at which we play these pulses, that will help reduce patient heating. Uh, and the last one here is cryogen gases are oxygen rich and MR contrast agents are 100% safe. False, right? So not oxygen rich, right? This is mostly liquid helium or, or, or helium in the gas phase. And contrast agents, although abundantly safe, these are very safe agents, they're certainly not 100% safe. Okay, so I put these learning objectives in here just as a way of sort of prompting you to go back and think about some of the material previously. I won't go through uh, sort of uh, uh, each of these, but you might use this as an exercise for understanding the material we've covered so far. Okay, I'm going to keep moving. We'll have learning objectives kind of throughout, and you can review those, or you can ask me questions about those uh, at any point. So let's talk about nuclear magnet magnetic resonance. We have a little bit of a hard hardware overview in terms of some of the basic safety and the main B0 field. Let's talk about the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance itself. So the MR signal, right? Where do we get the MR signal from? Well, principally water and fat. Water and fat have NMR active nuclei. They have a lot of hydrogen, right? Uh, so we get signal from things like water and fat. We get it from soft tissues like muscles, uh, various organs, and fat. And we get it from fluids, CSF, blood, synovial fluid. Those are all things that have hydrogen nuclei uh, that are uh, sensitive and available, so to speak, for actual imaging. Uh, but it's also important to recognize where we don't get image, where we don't get signal from. We don't typically get MRI signal from hard tissues. Things like cortical bone, ligaments and tendons are very difficult to see in teeth. And so if we look at the arm here, you can see uh, very brightly in the middle here, this is fat that's in the marrow of a long bone, right? But adjacent and surrounding that, it's very, very dark. It's cortical bone. So cortical bone is dark on MR. We don't really see it. We, we don't see the bone itself. You might see uh, edema uh, and things like that. Uh, okay, where else don't we get signal from? We don't get signal from gases, right? Lung, uh, air spaces, sinuses, bowel. So anything that's an air space or air filled cavity, we also will not get an MR signal from. So we get it from some places, we don't get it from other places. Oops, I don't know why this looks so funky. Um, that's right. So what is this whole NMR uh, phenomena about? Well, it turns out that the hydrogen nucleus has three important properties. You're familiar with the idea of it having mass, and in particular, we're just talking about the, really talking about the proton, but the proton has mass, the proton has charge, and what actually matters to us a lot is that the proton also has spin. And this is not a concept that most of you probably covered in, in any physics course uh, ever, but the consequence of spin and charge and mass is that something can be NMR active. What is spin? Well, spin is this intrinsic form of angular momentum, and you can really just sort of think of it as spinning. But there's something about the proton inherently, just like it has mass and you can't take it away, it has charge, you can't take it away, it has spin that you can't take away. It just inherently spins. Um, different nuclei will have spin angular momentum. In particular, they have to have an autotomic mass, the number of protons and neutrons, or an autotomic number, the number of protons. So, those things, or those are nuclei that will have so-called spin angular momentum. So they could uh, be available for MR imaging. Uh, spin angular momentum, we'll see in a second, that leads to so-called precession. Uh, spin and precession are not the same things. I'll make that distinction in a second. But a top spins, right? You spin it. And then it can also kind of wobble around at another frequency. And that wobbling is what we call precession. 
So a top can spin and process, the hydrogen nucleus also spins and precesses. And the frequency of that precession, the frequency at which it wobbles around, is called the Larmor frequency. Uh, and there's, there are a few things that govern what the frequency will be, what the Larmor frequency will be. In particular, it depends on what we call the gyromagnetic ratio, or gamma. The gyromagnetic ratio is a physical constant for a specific nucleus. I'll show you a table in a second. Um, and so uh, what's so important about the hydrogen nucleus? Well, it has spin, it has charge, and it has mass. Those are the three sort of critical properties there. Uh, this is just a, a, a large table of, of possible uh, uh, NMR active nuclei, and the only one we really care about right now is hydrogen. I do think it's important to remember the gyromagnetic ratio. This tells you the frequency that hydrogen will process uh, if you know the externally applied field. So this is megahertz per Tesla. So we just multiply this number by 3 to figure out what's the Larmor frequency at a 3T field or we multiply this number by one and a half to know the Larmor frequency at 1.5 Tesla. Uh, I won't go through the details of this whole chart. There's a lot of information in there. It's basically just highlighting, sorry, just highlighting that there are, there is the possibility to do imaging with other nuclei. Carbon-13, oxygen-17, fluorine, sodium, phosphorus. These are possibilities, but they're esoteric and, and certainly not widely used clinically. Uh, mostly, I should say, they're mostly not used because we can't generate high quality enough images. Protons are abundant, right? These other nuclei are not nearly abundant enough. Okay, so let's talk about the actual NMR phenomena. So here we have a bunch of water molecules, right? And we can zoom into the hydrogen, which is attached to an oxygen and then thereby another hydrogen. And if we zoom into this, uh, uh, to this hydrogen nucleus, we know that it's basically a proton. And that proton has a charge. And the consequence of having charge and spin is that it actually behaves like a little tiny magnet. Okay? Spinning charges act like little magnets. And so the hydrogen nucleus, you can think of it as behaving like a little tiny bar magnet with the north-south. Hydrogen will align in that externally B0 field. Right? That's the act of polarization, if you will. We also have spin and mass. And spin and mass means we have angular momentum. So just like a top will wobble around, it'll precess in a gravitational field, the hydrogen nucleus will actually precess in that B0 field, or it can be made to precess in that B0 field. So it's the magic combination of spin and mass and charge that gives us this precessing magnet, right? Every little hydrogen nucleus is like a wobbling around magnet, and it wobbles at a really particular frequency that we call the Larmor frequency. What, is the, what dictates the Larmor frequency? Two things. Gamma, we said a second ago that's 42.57 megahertz per Tesla. And then we have to multiply by B0. What's a typical B0 for us? 1.5 and 3. Those are the two clinical field strengths you'll encounter. 1.5 and 3. Uh, 70 is sort of coming. Um, Okay, so that's the basic kind of underlying what's happening at the individual sort of spin level. I think in your slides, I broke out some of the, some of the smaller frames from that movie. You can make some notes on if, if you want to. Okay, so remember, spin is not precession, right? You have intrinsic spin, and then this thing wobbles around or processes at a different frequency. And the protons precess in the presence of that B0 field, if you will. The Larmor frequency, the frequency at which things precess, is going to increase with larger B0. So it's higher and higher and higher frequency as we go from 1.5T to 3T. It's also going to be larger with a higher, higher gyromagnetic ratio. Now, we don't really care about too many different gammas. We really care about gamma for hydrogen, uh, but it's possible to consider other things as well. And higher frequency signals in general produce stronger signals. So there's an interest in imaging things at higher and higher frequencies one advantage is that they can produce a, a measurably uh, stronger signal. So in going from 1.5 to 3 Ts, that's one uh, advantageous uh, effect of increasing the field strength. Okay, so where are we on the electromagnetic spectrum? I think just good to put some context here against other imaging modalities. MR is actually really here on the, on the kind of far right-hand side. What does that mean? Well, we operate in sort of the megahertz range. And we have wavelengths that are on the order of you know, tens of centimeters or something like that. 
On the other end of the spectrum, when you get over to, uh, say, mammography, x-ray, uh, and so forth, you have very, very high frequency things with very, very short wavelengths. Uh, so you're sort of opposite ends of the spectrum here with MR being uh, kind of on its own towards uh, the right-hand side there. So MR uses low frequencies and relatively long wavelengths uh, for imaging uh, relative, if you compare them to, say, PET and CT, for example. Okay. Uh, a couple true falses. Electron spin is the key to NMR? No, it's proton. Right? We've only talked about proton spin, and really all of the MR you care about is all about proton spin. MRI is nothing without speed, charge, and mass. Spin, charge, and mass. Right? Speed's good. Speed's useful. Uh, all atomic nuclei are NMR active. Nope. Hydrogen is the one we really care about. There's some other esoteric ones. Spin and precession are the same thing. Nope. We have inherent spin, right? It's just like you have uh, mass and charge. This thing just spins. It just does. Uh, and then precession is what happens when you put these spins or these protons in the B0 field. They have a tendency to precess at the Larmor frequency in particular. Higher fields lead to faster precession. Yep, that's that Larmor relationship, right? Omega equals gamma B0. And of all the equations, you should remember that's one of them. I think you should know gamma, and I think you should know that omega equals gamma B0. Uh, all of the spins align with the B0 field. Uh, I didn't talk about this yet. It turns out uh, there's a phenomena called Zeeman splitting. Uh, and basically, it just means that the hydrogen nucleus, we, we put it in the B0 field to polarize it. And when we polarize it, there's some spins that go up and some spins that actually go down. And so we only have a small percentage of spins in this so-called spin-up state. Bottom line is that we don't use all of the spins for imaging. There's a really small percentage, parts per million, of spins that are actually available for uh, imaging. OK, so let's talk about the B0 field. I'm going to keep uh, uh, chugging here for a while. We had a little bit of a delay in the beginning there. Uh, we'll, we might take a break, but I'm going to keep moving so I can get through most of the material at least. Okay, so what's B0? B0 is a strong magnetic field. We've said this several times. It's greater than one and a half Tesla. The two typical field strengths are 1.5 and 3T. It's also a Z-oriented field, meaning that the, if you think of the patient that lies on the scanner and they go in head first, their head and feet point along or define sort of the long axis or the Z-axis of the scanner. Um, so it's a strong field that's Z-oriented. B0 also generates what we call bulk magnetization. The bulk magnetization is the alignment of all of those hydrogen nuclei, right? B0 is the polarizer that aligns things. We have billions and billions and billions of water molecules in a pixel, right? And all of those individual atomic nuclei contribute to forming what we call the bulk magnetization. And there, we just mean the sum or the average behavior of all of those spins that we estimate in a little pixel, right? We image with pixels, even though there's billions of spins in a pixel. Uh, and the more B0 we have, the more bulk magnetization we have. And that's the, that, that kind of drives the interest in going from 1.5T in the 80s to 3T in the 90s to 7T is, is an emerging sort of uh, space. Uh, and B0 forces the bulk magnetization to process. We saw this already. This is the Larmor equation. Definitely you want to remember this, that the Larmor frequency is equal to gamma times B. And we know what gamma is for hydrogen, 42.57 megahertz per Tesla. And we just multiply by our field strength, 1.5 or 3T, to get the Larmor frequency. <coughs> so how do we generate large magnetic fields? Well, if you picture a wire and then we run a current through that wire, running currents through wires will generate magnetic fields. And so these magnetic fields will be surrounding, if you will, uh, the wire itself. Interestingly, we can take a length of straight wire and we can bend it into a coil or a bunch of loops, and we can now generate a pretty high and relatively uniform magnetic field down the axis of uh, that loop of wire. There's different reasons why you might fill this with a, with a core. Obviously, uh, in the case of, a, of, a, of an MRI scanner, we don't have this core material in there because we need to place the patient in there. But the bottom line is currents in wires 
uh, generate a magnetic field. And in particular, this is really an electromagnet. So a current in a wire generates a magnetic field, and that's an electromagnet. Anytime we put electricity through a wire, we can do this. And that's what the MRI scanner does as well. There's a lot of electricity coursing through a lot of wire uh, to generate these really strong fields. And so MRI scanners are, in fact, superconducting electromagnets. That's what the big B0 field here is. I've cut it away. And all I'm trying to show you here is that there's a lot of wire, and this is all superconducting wire, very unusual metal construction, if you will. It's surrounded by liquid helium. Older magnets used to sound, surround that with liquid nitrogen. And this, these wires here have a huge amount of current, you know, hundreds of amps of current. Uh, and the consequence of having a lot of current in the superconducting wires, you can generate very strong magnetic fields, much stronger than you know, we're sort of conventionally uh, uh, working with. So what do I mean by strong? Well, one reference is the Earth's field. Earth's field is half a gauss, right? A strong refrigerator magnet's about 10 to 100 gauss. The magnetic fields that we care about for imaging are like 15,000 gauss or 30,000 gauss. And here you can see and probably should remember that 1.5 Tesla is 15,000 gauss. So there's this conversion factor of 10,000, which is a little unfortunate that it's not 1,000 because that would just seem a little bit easier. But all the same, it's 10. Okay, so we have this really strong magnetic field and we want to place this thing in a hospital, right? There's some things that we have to take into consideration. And one is so-called shielding. If that magnetic field strays well outside this room and creeps into the adjacent room, that'll create operational problems for the other rooms, right? And so we have to use some kind of shielding to limit uh, how far the B0 field can get out of the room we care about. Uh, that's good in some ways. It can reduce the footprint. You can put your scanner in a smaller room because the magnetic field doesn't stray as far. Uh, and that will, uh, can reduce the install cost, can reduce interference with other nearby things. How do we shield the magnet? Well, one way is with so-called passive shielding. You can, uh, you can uh, I don't know why I said it this way, uh, you can use iron room shielding. So you can actually put plates of iron surrounding the room so that the magnetic field sort of doesn't get through and outside. Uh, but that's pretty heavy and it's not particularly cheap. It turns out it's quite expensive to line a room even with steel, which doesn't sound so expensive, but actually is. Another option is so-called active shielding. The manufacturers themselves design the magnet to have a smaller footprint, to have a smaller stray magnetic field. And so the important thing to remember here is we have to shield the magnet somehow to prevent it from uh, leaking into other rooms and causing problems. And one thing you'll encounter in this regard is so-called five gauss line. I think you want to remember this. The five gauss line is the threshold beyond which ferromagnetic objects are strictly prohibited. And so every MRR suite will have a five gauss line. And it means you don't want to go past that line into a stronger and stronger and stronger field, especially if you have certain ferromagnetic devices with you. Uh, and that's things like pacemakers, um, general electronic devices, but also your wallet, your keys, your pager, your glasses, your pen, all these kinds of things. So we're always conscientious in a, from a safety perspective of, of the location of the five gauss line, which is going to be very near and close to the scanner itself, uh, but we have to know where this is. Um, there are different MR zones. I won't sort of bore you with the details. The basic idea is that the zone one is where you come into an MR environment, sort of the building itself, and it increases all the way up to zone four where you're in the scanner suite itself. And this is generally regards how we uh, sort of monitor patients and make sure that patients make their way safely before an examination in the MR room, that we have a chance for them to disrobe, change their clothes, and uh, leave their wallet and keys behind. So four different zones before you get to the MR suite itself. Okay, so B0 strength. In general, B0, uh, as it gets stronger, that's going to increase the polarization. It's going to increase the amount of hydrogen nuclei that we can use for imaging. And why is that good? Well, in principle, that can increase your signal to noise. And signal to noise is good, right? We want higher quality images, more signal, less noise. Uh, it increases roughly proportional to B0 squared. And if you have more signal to noise, then maybe you can increase your spatial resolution, maybe your temporal resolution, or decrease your scan time. So different ways that those things sort of trade off. Uh, there are disadvantages as well. And one of the main disadvantages of going to higher field strengths is that as B0 increases, the specific absorption rate in general increases. So it's harder to have a low SAR exam at 3T, 
and SAR can become a limiting uh, uh, condition for putting together protocols. So we have to be a little conscientious of uh, what happens at higher and higher fields. Another uh, interesting thing that happens is that as you increase B0, you increase what we call chemical shift. We haven't, we're going to talk about it now, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it turns out that fat and water don't resonate at the same frequency. So we have the Larmor frequency for water, fat's a little bit different from that by a couple hundred hertz. Uh, as you go, as you increase the B0 field from 1.5 T to 3 T, you'll actually increase the amount of chemical shift that's, uh, that's apparent. Uh, and that's because you increase the, the change in frequency between fat and water. So fat and water, uh, the thing to really remember is that fat and water have different, slightly different Larmor frequencies. It's about 220 hertz different at 1.5 T and 40 hertz different at 3 T. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but you have so-called chemical shift artifacts, type 1 and type 2, uh, that can be confounding in your imaging. Uh, again, we'll get to that a little bit later, but that's uh, something to think about. Uh, and higher and higher field strengths can be good for spectroscopy. I won't spend a lot of time talking about spectroscopy, but it gives you the ability to, to see sort of specific chemical species a little bit more uh, easily if you have higher and higher field strengths. A downside, of course, is that as you increase B0, you're going to increase the cost, and the rough number I use is a million per Tesla, so you have to uh, appreciate that as well. Let's talk a little bit about chemical shift. So, Chemical shift, the idea is that hydrogen nuclei precess at different frequencies depending on their local chemical environment. Uh, so orbiting electrons can shield the nucleus, you have, depending on the exact uh, configuration of the molecule. And the specific Larmor frequency uh, reference that we use is tetramethylsilane. It doesn't really matter too much, but the chemists assign that a chemical shift of zero, principally because all of these hydrogen nuclei have very identical uh, electron clouds uh, surrounding them. What does that all mean? Well, more practically what we care about is the shift between water and fat. Fat has a slightly different uh, Larmor frequency. It's still hydrogen that we're imaging. It's still H1, but it has a slightly different Larmor frequency because the electrons surrounding a proton in fat are different than the electrons in water. Um, and the consequence is that you have this small uh, shift uh, of fat uh, molecules relative to water molecules. So they don't resonate at the same frequency and they're different by a few parts per million. So not parts per hundred or percent, but parts per million. What does that mean? Well, it's about 3.35 parts per million different of, between fat and water. And that means you're different by about 200 hertz or 215 hertz if you multiply the parts per million by the Larmor frequency, in this case at 1.5 T. So this is the gyromagnetic ratio for water multiplied by 1.5 T. And it just says that fat's a little bit different. And that actually causes uh, some image artifacts that we'll talk about later. Um, we refer to this as chemical shift. Mostly when we talk about chemical shift, we just care about the chemical shift of fat. Okay. Uh, B0, the B0 we use in these scanners is a rare earth permanent magnet. No, what kind of magnet is it? We use two big words. It's an electromagnet, and it's also superconducting, right? So the B0 is a superconducting electromagnet. Uh, one Tesla equals 1,000 Gauss. No, this is that unfortunate thing, right? It's 10,000. Uh, and we switch. Unfortunately, in MR, people will talk about Gauss, and people will talk about Tesla, depending on exactly what they're interested in. Higher fields, higher B0, increases polarization, which contributes to better image quality. Yep, I see a couple nods. That's, that's the underlying reason why there's an interest in higher and higher fields. More polarization, more uh, protons available for imaging. Exams at higher fields have lower SAR. Nope, right? So as we go up to 3T, we have more SAR in our exams typically. And at 7T, this becomes even more of a challenge. So lower field, lower SAR. Higher field, higher SAR. Uh, hydrogen or H1 always precesses at the, at the same Larmor, I'm not sure why I got cut off there, but the same Larmor frequency? No. So what was the main reason it's a little bit different that we just talked about? Chemical shift. I saw someone say it, right? So we have this chemical shift effect. So the Larmor frequency for fat spins is a little bit different than water spins. Sorry, I got cut off there. Okay, I'm going to keep chugging here. So bulk magnetization. So we, we talked about this just a second ago. 
Uh, and the individual magnetic uh, hydrogen nucleus behaves as what we call a magnetic dipole. We don't really care about individual hydrogen. They're too tiny and too abundant, right? But we, So what we more generally think about is what we call the bulk magnetization. And the bulk magnetization is in some volume that we care about. Usually we think about pixels. In some pixel, there are billions and billions of hydrogen nuclei, billions and billions of these magnetic dipoles. And we just add up all of those magnetic dipoles. We just sum them up. And that gives rise to what we refer to as the bulk magnetization. So the bulk magnetization is just all of those things combined. But you have to remember, you know, Avogadro is at play here, right? And so we're talking about, you know, 10 to the 23rd magnetic dipoles in a, in a, a voxel or a pixel that's 2 by 2 by 10. And imaging resolution for MR, this is, you know, kind of on the intermediate side. But there's billions and billions of these things tucked away in the voxels that we care about. So this is uh, one picture you should have in your mind for when the B0 field is off. Now we can't turn the B0 field off, right? It's always on. It's just energetic and we keep it energized. But we can do this little thought experiment where we place a patient in the scanner. The patient has a bunch of hydrogen nuclei. And those hydrogen nuclei are just going to randomly point in every possible direction when B0 is off, right? There's nothing there to organize them. So they point in all directions. Now when we turn the B0 field on, the B0 field can polarize the spins and generate what we call bulk magnetization. And this is the whole point of calling B0 the polarizer. It causes things to fall into an alignment uh, when they're in the presence of that B0 uh, field, if you will. Now it turns out there's a little trick here, and I said this before, some spins will actually point up and some spins will actually point down. They're all aligned with B0, but some for and some against. And it's only because there's a small difference in that distribution. It's not 50-50. It's a little bit out of 50-50 that we end up with a signal or bulk magnetization that's available to us. And this is the principle of Zeeman splitting. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, I won't get into a lot of the details here, but the bottom line is you have spin up, spins that can point up, you have spins that can point down, and you have a total number of spins. So here we can talk about the just like the, the percentage of spins up versus down. And this is proportional in physics to a bunch of constants, uh, things that we can control and a bunch of constants that we can't. We can plug in some numbers here. I won't go through the, the, the procedural steps here. But the result is that you'll see that the difference between the spin up and spin down is only about 4.5 parts per million at 1.5t. That means I have you know, a million plus five spins pointing up and a million spins pointing down. It's just barely different, right, by a few parts per million. But that's enough to give us uh, an, an, a, a signals available for generating quite good images. So as a consequence, only a few parts per million difference up versus down uh, is, is enough to, give a, uh, to, to produce MR images, but we would also uh, indicate that MR has relatively low sensitivity. Right? We have to have a ton of water available to even make these images in the first place. And that's very different than you think of PET, uh, for example. PET uses a small amount of a radio tracer, has very, very high sensitivity to small molecular concentrations. Here we're trying, we're just barely able to do, it, do imaging uh, of water in your body, right? So very different ends of the spectrum in terms of sensitivity. Okay, some learning objectives that I won't go through, but you can use these as ways to link back to the material that we did talk about. Okay, so let's talk about off resonance. Uh, I mentioned much earlier on this idea of on resonance. The radio frequency energy has to be on resonant. It has to be at a particular frequency. In fact, it should be at the Larmor frequency if it's going to excite or engage the spin system. So what's off resonance? Well, the B0 field isn't perfect, right? We want it to be a one and a half Tesla field, but it's not a one and a half Tesla field, you know, exactly, right? And so the idea here is that B0 magnets or the magnets in general aren't perfect. B0 field inhomogeneity, uh, meaning if it's imperfect, that can lead to image uh, distortions and phase artifacts, different problems with your underlying images. Ideally, we want B0 to be really perfect. We can, in fact, improve the homogeneity or the, the evenness of the B0 field in, in two ways. We can do so-called passive shimming. So imagine you've got a big magnet, and it's close to 1.5t, but not quite. Uh, the engineer can actually place these ferromagnetic structures in the scanner to kind of shape the field. They can push the field around by putting in these little uh, passive shims. 
And there are also uh, ways where once a patient is introduced to the scanner, you can actually do active shimming. And so the patient themselves will slightly disrupt the magnetic field, and we can correct that using so-called active shimming, ways of tuning the scanner, if you will, to make it even more perfect. Uh, ideally, we want a, a very uniform, very, very, you know, to within a few parts per million uniform B0 field in, a, in the thing that you're trying to image. Okay, so I want to introduce a term here called an isochromat. And an isochromat is just a group of spins with the same resonant frequency, okay? If they have the same resonant frequency, they're all going to have the same gamma, right? They all have the same gyromagnetic ratio, at least we're talking about water here. Um, then they're going to have, uh, they'll be exposed to the same B0 field if they are an isochromat. And again, I said this before, but ideally all spins in a system have the same resonance frequency. Uh, what is that? What, what are the possibilities? Well, you could end up with multiple isochromats, meaning different groups of spins at different Larmor frequencies. If your B0 field isn't perfect, if chemical shift plays a role, right, uh, fat and water, for example, uh, I won't get into magnetic susceptibility differences yet, or, or we can turn on these gradients. These gradients induce changes in our B0 field. Uh, these things in particular are sources of what we call off resonance. Anytime the field at the, you know, near the spins drifts away from the target field, those spins will be off resonance. We prefer them to be on resonance, but they'll be off resonance. So off resonance refers to spins that resonate at a frequency different than gamma B0. Something has happened typically to B0 to shift those spins away just a little bit. Uh, when we order scanners and buy scanners, they come with a specification about the field homogeneity. And the idea here is just indicating that were we to measure the maximum field and the minimum field and divide by the mean field in some sphere of interest near the middle of the scanner, we expect the, the uniformity to be on the order of about a part per million uh, uh, volumetric root mean square. So these are very, very you know, nearly perfect scanners. So B0, I would say, is perfect within a few parts per million. So it's not 1.5 Tesla plus or minus 0.1 Tesla, right? It's 1.5 Tesla plus or minus a micro Tesla, right? Very uniform fields. <coughs> okay, so what's the consequence of off resonance? Well, it can, can contribute to what we call spin dephasing or the, la the loss of what we call spin phase coherence. I'll show you a diagram in just a second, usually within a voxel, and that leads to a decreased echo or a decreased signal that we actually measure. And so let's look at uh, some spins on the left and some spins on the right. Uh, in a second, this will start moving. And the spins on the left, we have these as individual magnetic dipoles, and they're going to be processing around in a really homogeneous field, a perfect field, if you will. On the right-hand side here, you have the same set of spins, but they're going to process in an inhomogeneous field. On the left-hand side, uh, here we have a coil as well. So on the left-hand side, these spins are wobbling around, and as they wobble around and precess, they're going, to, they're going to swing past my coil, and they're going to give me a, a, a voltage or a current that I can measure. And that voltage or that current is precessing at the Larmor frequency, right? This is maybe 64 megahertz or something like that. Uh, and those spins stayed coherent. They all stayed together because they were all precessing at the same frequency. On the right-hand side, however, there's some reason, some source of, uh, of the field to be inhomogeneous and the spins start to fall out of phase with one another. One's going a little bit faster, one's going a little bit slower, because the magnetic field's not identically uh, the same everywhere. And the consequence is that as they fall out of phase with one another, we refer to this as spin dephasing, and they can, uh, they can only induce a, a smaller and smaller and smaller signal in our coil until in fact they maybe uh, have disappeared almost entirely, or the signal is imperceptible. So the consequence is that we get signal loss from off-resonance spin dephasing. We want our spins to stay coherent, but they don't always. And if they don't, then we lose signal. And losing signal means uh, poor image quality or even really dark images. Okay, off-resonance, true-false. Fat is the only source of off-resonance. False. There's lots of sources, right? Uh, susceptibility differences, uh, different chemical shift uh, agents, uh, magnetic field imperfections. Intravoxel spin dephasing leads to signal losses. True or false? True. 
right? This is the concept I was just uh, trying to convey, uh, where that loss of spins pointing in the same direction causes the signal amplitude to drop. The specific chemical environment of H1 shifts the local magnetic field and hence the Larmor frequency. Maybe a little confusing is written, but, but yes, right? If, if, if those hydrogen nuclei are tucked away in fat or they're tucked away in water or they're tucked away in something else, uh, that local uh, chemical environment will change the Larmor frequency slightly. Uh, active and passive shields can improve B0. Those are two techniques we use. Uh, active ones can be tuned up on a patient-specific basis, and the passive ones are, are done sort of when the scanner is installed itself. All right, I'm going to keep going here. We're going to talk about B1 pulses. We talked about B0, B0. What's the main thing that B0 does? What's the one word you use to describe B0? It's the polarizer, right? It causes the spins to be in the sort of spin up or spin down condition. So think of it as the polarizer. It makes spins available for imaging. So once they're organized by that B0 field, the next thing is to typically use RF pulses. RF pulses let us excite the system and thereby uh, uh, generate um, signals that we can acquire. So we saw this, uh, one of the very first slides, the sort of classic excitation reception. We're going to play an RF pulse to excite our spins, and then we're going to be able to receive some kind of signal, uh, what we call a free induction decay or an echo. And that free induction decay or that echo uh, induces a current in a, new in a nearby coil. That's Faraday's law of induction. We can measure that current uh, in, in ways that we'll get to later and uh, use that, that uh, recorded signal to help build up imaging information. That's the sort of complicated part. So MR uses radio frequency or B1 pulses to excite spins. So B0 is the polarizer, B1 is the exciter. Uh, so a few things about B1. B1 is, is in the radio frequency range, right? So this is operating at 42 uh, megahertz per Tesla. That means about 63 megahertz for a 1.5 Tesla scanner. Uh, and so that's why we refer to it as, as radio frequency. It's very high frequencies, which is in the radio wave uh, range. These are short duration pulses as well, right? Uh, maybe 100 microseconds to a few milliseconds, something like that. So sh that's why we call them RF pulses. They're small in amplitude relative to our B0 field, maybe just tens of microtesla or, or a few microtesla. Uh, I won't get too into it, but they're circularly polarized. Importantly, they're magnetic fields, and they're perpendicular to B0. So B0 was pointing along the z-direction. It caused spins to align for or against the z-direction. The B1 field points somewhere in the xy plane, somewhere in the xy plane such that it can act on the spin system and cause it to tip over. Uh, that's the exciting uh, concept behind RF pulses. So how does this, where's the hardware component that does this? We saw this earlier, but in the middle of the scanner here, nearby what we call ISO center, the 000 coordinate, we have a body transmit coil. And that transmit coil is capable of generating an RF pulse that's on resonance to the spins and can excite them. Uh, so MR systems typically use that body coil to excite things. Uh, an interesting thing that we have to keep in mind is that uh, our whole room, our MRI room, this is during the middle of an installation over an MP300, the room itself is actually clad in copper. And the reason for that is the energy that we're using for exciting the spins is in the radio frequency range, and the energy that we, we receive back in our coil is in the radio frequency range. Uh, and so literally, we're not that far away from, say, local radio stations, and that radio frequency energy from external sources, from all kinds of electronic equipment and radio stations and all kinds of things could get into our MR room and we don't want it to get into our MR room because then we would measure that as part of our imaging information. And so we need to shield local sources from interfering and we do that by cladding the whole room in copper which, which produces what we call a Faraday cage and limits external electromagnetic radio frequency energy from getting into the MR room. So MR rooms are shielded with a, with a Faraday cage to prevent RF energy from getting in. So this is uh, a cartoon that I put together for the process of excitation. And so what we're looking at right now is, uh, is the scanner, if you will. Let's back this up a little bit. Uh, 
you're looking at a cross section of the scanner and maybe we're looking at an axial image through the patient on the left there. These spins you'll see in just a second, they're just little magnets. They're little red on top or white on top, red on the bottom magnets. And the process of excitation looks something like this. If I put radio frequency energy into the system at the Larmor frequency, I can get these spins. You'll see it happening here in just a second. They start wobbling around and now the energy has pushed those spins into the transverse plane and they process at the Larmor frequency. So the RF energy went in to cause that excitation to take spins from the Z direction uh, into the transverse plane. And when they're in the transverse plane, they're also wobbling around at that Larmor frequency, and that uh, gives rise to the, uh, the energy that we can actually measure from the patient. We'll, we'll get into that in just a second. So the important thing is that RF pulses generate transverse magnetization. And in particular, they can do this for a particular slice. And so if we're thinking of axial images, we'll apply RF energy in such a way as to excite one slice and then excite another slice and then excite another slice. And again, the main message here is that RF pulses help generate transverse magnetization. And I sort of said it, but I can be more clear about it. We are only able to detect and measure transverse magnetization. We have to create transverse magnetization to build up uh, imaging information. Uh, sorry, that's me. Okay, lots of different types of RF pulses, and I won't go through all of these uh, today, but we'll see some quick examples. We have excitation pulses, similar to what we just saw. We tip the spins over and create some transverse magnetization. We have inversion pulses, where we can actually tip the magnetization all the way upside down, right? And we'll talk about those applications. Uh, I don't think it comes up today. I think it's tomorrow. Um, and then we also have another category of pulses that we call uh, refocusing pulses. So, those are probably the three main RF pulses that you should remember. Uh, there are, in fact, other pulses, saturation pulses, a bunch of other more complicated things that we won't get into in, in this class. But those three, at least, are important to, uh, to remember. Okay, so what are, we, what are we talking about? Well, one thing that's uh, important or good to remember is that we actually have two different coordinate frames that we could talk about. Let me pause this. We have what we call the laboratory frame, and we have what we call the rotating frame. The laboratory frame is you and I standing next to the scanner and looking at it and trying to understand what a spin is doing while it's being excited. So here, picture orange as, a, as, a, as the bulk magnetization, right? This is the composite magnetization from billions and billions of hydrogen nuclei. Now I'm going to put some radio frequency energy into my system at the Larmor frequency, and this is the process it will undergo. That radio, oops, let me start that one. This one. The radio frequency energy will, will push the spin into the transverse plane, and all the while it's precessing at the Larmor frequency until it lies down flat at, say, 90 degrees. So we've tipped it effectively 90 degrees, but that whole time it's still precessing at the Larmor frequency. This can be confusing. This is what is physically happening in the so called LARP laboratory frame but it's a little bit confusing maybe to conceptualize. The other option is to get into the rotating frame. And the rotating frame just means you and I all spin around at the Larmor frequency. We just spin around at 64 megahertz. It's like getting on the merry-go-round and it's easier to see what's happening right in front of you now. So uh, another description of that same radio frequency pulse in the rotating frame looks like this. We get rid of that processional behavior and the spin just simply tips down by 90 degrees. And so this is on the left-hand side is what's physically happening. On the right-hand side is conceptually just a little bit easier to, to understand. And this is why we call it a 90-degree pulse, that it tips into the transverse plane. You can sort of see it a little bit more easily here in the rotating frame. So again, lots of different um, uh, possible RF uh, pulses. Uh, excitation pulses is one category of pulse. Uh, you'll see uh, shortly that we use these 90 degree pulses tipping into the transverse plane for lots of sequences, for spin echo sequences in particular. But we also use smaller flip angles. Maybe we just tip a little bit, right? We could tip by 10 degrees. I still generate a little bit of transverse magnetization when I do that. Not all of this magnetization, but at least a little bit of magnetization. And there's reasons why, why using small flip angles may be effective for the image contrast that you want. Uh, as an example. And there are other examples of using even 
larger flip angles. But these are all what I refer to as excitation pulses, going from the z-axis and tipping over partly or tipping over all the way by, say, 90 degrees. Another possibility, sorry, another possibility here is the inversion pulse, right? The inversion pulse will put RF energy into the system at the Larmor frequency, but do so long enough to actually uh, invert the magnetization. So it should show, let me get to the movie really quick, we'll come back to that. Um, here we can tip the magnetization over by uh, 180 degrees, right? So we've gone from, let's see, from the fully upright position to the fully inverted position. Now, it's not obvious why you might want to do that. Why would you want to take your spin system from here and turn it all the way upside down? But there are a number of applications. Most of them are related to manipulating image contrast and specifically introducing uh, more T1 weighting in your images. We'll talk a lot about T1 weighted images and T2 weighted images once we get through um, sort of today's lecture. And so we'll talk about uh, using so-called short tau inversion recovery or stir imaging for suppressing specific tissues like fat. Uh, we'll talk about flare, uh, which is a, which uses an inversion pulse to suppress signal from uh, from fluids like uh, CSF. Uh, lots of different sort of possibilities here, but uh, those would probably be the two most important ones. Another application that we'll see uh, a little bit um, that we'll talk about a lot more tomorrow in particular is the use of what we call refocusing pulses. And so this is your first introduction to a, to a pulse sequence. Uh, pulse sequences are just timing diagrams that tell us about the sequence of events used to generate the image that we're interested in. And this particular sequence is the spin echo sequence, and it uses a 90 degree pulse. So the 90 degree pulse is going to bring the magnetization down, and then it uses a re so-called refocusing pulse. And so watch, watch what happens here as the movie progresses. So, the 90 degree pulse is going to tip the magnetization down, and now it's in the transverse plane. Now, unfortunately, because of sources of off resonance, we don't have a perfect B0 field. Sources of off resonance will call this, cause the spins to process at slightly different frequencies. This was that intravoxel spin dephasing I was talking about earlier. But someone, uh, Erwin Hahn, in fact, discovered this sort of neat trick that you can play a refocusing pulse. The refocusing pulse flips everything over like a pancake. That's a 180 degree flip. And now those same sources of off resonance actually cause those uh, spins to come back together again and help us form what we call an echo. So right when they come back together again, imagine that they're also precessing, right? This is all happening at the Larmor frequency also. We can detect and measure a nice strong signal. So the hallmark of the spin echo sequence is this 90-180 pair. So if you see a pulse sequence diagram with a 90 and a 180, it's a spin echo sequence. Yeah, Joyce. Uh, I'll talk about that more tomorrow when we get to the spin echo lecture. Uh, what, what it, the, the short answer is there's a lot of flexibility in that timing, but it does govern your, your ultimate image contrast. And so I could, for example, uh, I play this 90. I have some dephasing here. I could play the 180 now and focus that amount of dephasing. If I wait longer, I have more and more dephasing. And now if I wait this long and I play my 180, then my echo will just form later. If I move my 180 to be earlier, then my echo will form earlier. We'll come back to that concept when we talk more about spin echoes. Uh, okay. So these 180 pulses really uh, give us the largest spin echo signal effectively and they refocus spins due to off resonance, all those different sources of off resonance that we talked about before. Uh, lots of applications. I won't get into all of these today. We'll talk more about spin echoes uh, later, but RARE is one. It stands for the Rapid Acquisition with Relaxation Enhancement, and I apologize that MR has so much jargon. Uh, I try to sort of limit it, believe it or not. Um, and we'll get into some more details about the spin echo sequence, but remember that a, that a, that a, a critical ingredient to that sequence is this so-called uh, refocusing pulse, this 180 refocusing pulse. And there are other techniques as well, spin echo EPI, that we'll get to uh, much later. Okay, so quick true-false. RF pulses are the main sources of patient heating. Yep. That's what causes, that's the one thing that we have to mitigate. We have to sort of manage RF pulses so that patients aren't heated up too much or they stay within FDA guidelines. RF pulses excite spins and create transverse magnetization. True. 
right? We're tipping the magnetization over. The RF energy goes in at the Larmor frequency, tips it over. We have transverse magnetization. We can use that for imaging. RF pulses are typically hundreds of milliseconds long. That was like a little tidbit in there a while ago. So hundreds of milliseconds is, is, is a long time scale. We're going we're gonna to end up using like thousands of RF pulses to create images, right? And so uh, the, 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 the hint here is that hundreds of milliseconds would be very long for an RF pulse. RF pulses are typically hundreds of microseconds or maybe a few milliseconds. Uh, and I do. Th I think it's important to have a sense for the time scale, right? The mag, how strong is an RF pulse, and what's its duration. I think that starts helping you build some intuition for what's going on here. Uh, excitation pulses are not required for imaging. False, right? We have to excite spins. We have to get energy into that spin system to be able to generate an image uh, of any kind. Okay. Uh, so learning objectives again. You can use these to go back and and, and try to. Uh, uh, think about um, uh, the concepts that we've been covering. Uh, yeah, please. Does the um, impedance depend on the uh, speed on the process you're running, or is it just the amount? <laughs> it's such a great question. Uh, the, 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 the wonderful and terrible thing about MR is that there, there is infrequently simple relationships like that. And so what I can say is that the flip angle can change the image contrast, but I can't say that higher and higher is more contrast. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that somewhere from a low flip angle to a high flip angle, there's actually an, an optimum flip angle for the best contrast. And so the best, con and, it, and then that depends, are you trying to get a proton density weighted image or a T1 weighted image? Then the choice of flip angle will will govern whether you get a proton density weighted image or a T1 weighted image. So it's not just higher and higher. Is, I, I think what you, w what you don't want to make the mistake of is thinking that higher and higher is sort of better and better, right? Unfortunately, everything in MR has sort of like an optimum, has sort of a somewhere in between is almost always the best answer, which makes things complicated. Inversion pulses do change image contrast, yeah. And we haven't, we'll get to that concept a little bit later. Uh, if you want a quick uh, uh, sort of thought about, you know, why that would possibly be the case, I can take my spin system uh, and maybe I have fat and I have water, right? And I can play an inversion pulse and I'm going to invert those spins, right? We haven't talked about relaxation yet, but these fat and water relax at different rates. And as a consequence of relaxing at different rates, I can get a lot of image contrast differences by inverting spins and maybe waiting until this one is really close to zero and fat is, could still be bright. It'll make more sense when I probably have some slides and some, and some uh, images to go with that. So, yep. so do these repulse and not pulse excitation? They don't pulse it before they get to the right spin to yeah. align a certain way, right? Yeah, so, so I wouldn't even say B0 pulse, just B0 field, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but the B0 pulse Can be used to. So the last question basically is what I'm getting to. Let's say uh, that, um, you want me to create an expectation uh -huh. to um, create an image, um, but the B zero pulse also be used, and this this we talk. We we use them all together, right? And so the B zero field is always on, and the spins are always exposed to that B zero field, and that's what gives us this sort of like availability of spins. If B0 was off, then the spins just point in every direction, and it's not very useful. So B0 polarizes, and then B1 excites. So you need both, not just the B0. You need both. Yeah, correct. Yes, I see what you're getting at. Yes, you need both. Uh, let me just take a quick peek here. Okay, so now uh, one of the, uh, there's maybe two more hardware components to get through, and one is coils, and coils are our receivers, and this is a re relatively massive array of coils. We wouldn't usually use this many coils uh, the, uh, for an individual patient, but it sort of demonstrates what's possible here, I suppose. So again, the idea is Faraday's law of induction. If I have a set of spins, and the spins have a component of transverse magnetization after a B1 pulse, I can 
detect that signal if I have placed a nearby coil. So these processing spins here will generate a signal in my coil. That coil is connected to a computer and I can measure this oscillation. Again, the real trick in MR is how do you store image contrast information, how do you store image pixel location in this echo, the signal that we receive. That's complicated, but we're going to work towards an understanding of that. And it's all through the principle of Faraday's law of induction that we can do this uh, at all. Uh, and the trick is encoding spatial information and image contrast. So lots of different coils in MR. Uh, coils can be used to transmit the B1 field. We saw that before, this sort of cutaway of the scanner and this B1 uh, element was there. Typically that's called what we call the body coil. It's possible that at some sites you can have a head coil or a knee coil that can also transmit and receive. Remember, we're transmitting radio frequency energy at the Larmor frequency and we're receiving energy at the Larmor frequency. So these coils are uh, similar. In general, coils receive the NMR signal, and typically we have head, head coils, knee coils, body coils, various surface coils. Very infrequently do we use the so-called body coil. I know this, this is a little confusing nomenclature because, because we use the same word coil, but we have that coil in the middle of the scanner, the body coil here, which is built-in hardware component to the big tube, and that's really the principal exciter. It occasionally can be used as a receiver. It's mostly the, the exciter. So this body coil here is the exciter. Uh, the other coils that we use are the receiving coils, and here is an array of possible receiving coils, right? Here's a wrist coil, here's a shoulder coil, a knee coil, uh, a coils that can be placed flexibly on the abdomen or the chest. Here's a breast coil, here's a foot ankle coil lots of possibilities and the idea is that you want the coil to be as close as possible to the anatomy of interest. Use a knee coil when you're imaging the knee that'll give you of course the best images and the closer the coil is to the anatomy the stronger the signals and that's why in general these are very conforming coils right the foot ankle coil really conforms to the foot and ankle uh, to get us the best image quality. Uh, there are, in fact, different kinds of coils. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but there are so-called volume coils and so-called surface coils. If you go back to this image here, this knee coil is a good example of a volume coil. It's very hard. All the elements are held and fixed in place in a very specific way, and that actually has certain advantages for receiving signals. But that's not always practical. If you want to image the chest and the abdomen, it's difficult to put someone inside a, you know, something that's a, is, is sort of hard as a knee coil. And so we have these more flexible arrays, uh, which you can see here and over here. They conform to the body more, uh, uh, especially given the variability in sort of chest and abdomen shape relative to, say, head shape or maybe foot and ankle shape. And so we have a wide array of surface coils as well that generally are flexi allow for flexible positioning and placement. And they have high signal to noise maybe near the coil, but it falls off as you get more distant from the coil. So these coils are really sensitive to what's kind of immediately underneath them or a few centimeters of what's underneath them. Uh, it turns out, uh, as an example at least, that the head coil actually has many channels, right? What does that mean? Well, this is the head image that we acquire, but that head image is actually a composite uh, from multiple channels inside the head coil. So there's a loop of wire, you know, sort of anterior here, and there are other loops of wire that are posterior. Each of those loops constitutes what we call a channel. And in this case, we get images from each of the channels, but each channel is really only sensitive to the tissue that it's close to. And we have to add up or composite all of these channels such that we get a nice uniform image of the head. So it's a subtlety, it actually matters because there are ways that we can use this sort of coil design to in fact speed up how quickly we can image. We are after all getting eight images simultaneously, they're just not uh, all images that, are, that cover the same anatomy equally well. And so here we would say that each coil or each, each coil element or each channel has a unique what we call sensitivity profile. It only captures certain parts of the anatomy well just because of its geometric location. Some, some are anterior and catch anterior tissues, others are posterior. Okay, coils, true or false. Faraday's law of induction is the principal underlying signal reception. 
yes, right? We saw this kind of in a, in a couple different places today, but yes, that's, that's the one you want to remember. The body coil is typically used for receiving MRI signals. No, right? So we had a bunch of surface coils, head coil, shoulder coil, knee coil, chest coil. Those we use for receiving. The body coil, if we go back just quickly, the body coil was this hardware element here, right, uh, that is distant from the body. So it's not very good for receiving, but it's good at exciting. And so we use the body coil typically for exciting rather than receiving. Step back in here. Uh, sorry, surface coils, uh, I skipped this one here, but surface coils transmit RF excitation pulses? False, right? It's the body coil that does that. And most coils work for most body parts? False, right? We have coils that are specific, right? Knee coil, head coil, chest coil, uh, specific to the anatomy. So we don't use a knee coil in any other location. Yeah, so it's interesting. It, it, it doesn't in general, right? So uh, here there's no gantry, there's no spinning gantry as you would have in CT. Uh, in MR, in principle, you can sort of slide the table through and do like continuous imaging, more similar to what's done in CT. It just doesn't turn out to have the same advantage. And so more typically, the patient is stationary and the imaging system behind the scenes takes care of moving the slice through the patient. We'll talk about that actually in the, some in the context of gradients. So, so gradients, the GX, GY, GZ, what are these principally responsible for? What's their number one? Spatial encoding, right? So you have to remember it for that in particular. Okay, so let's take a, a look at our hardware design again, and we can see that the gradients are sort of several and many components in here, right? So the Z gradient is in, gru in green, uh, the X gradient is in red, the Y gradient is in yellow. Uh, it doesn't matter the exact sort of configuration of these things. It's just to point out that these gradient components are tucked away inside the big tube, right? The part that, the, that you uh, uh, slide into. <coughs> so we know this already, right? Um, you guys are picking up on this, I think. But the primary function of the gradients is to encode spatial information. We'll talk about how that happens much later. Slice selection, phase encoding, and frequency encoding are the three main steps. So that's a, um, just looking ahead to what we'll talk about when we get to that. Uh, there are secondary functions as well that we don't need to worry about here in particular. Uh, for each of the, like B0 field, the B1 field, I was telling you, sort of trying to give you conceptually what these things are. So this, we'll do the same thing for the gradients. The gradients are relatively small. We measure gradients in terms of Gauss per centimeter. That's the most common way. And gradient just means slope, right? It has a, it, it has a, uh, um, uh, it, it has a function over distance. And so gradients are magnetic fields that vary over distance, right? That's why we measure them in Gauss per centimeter. And so how small are they? Well, at the edge of a 30 centimeter field of view, that's plus minus 15 centimeters from isocenter. If I multiply 15 centimeters by 5 gauss per centimeter, I'm going to get like millitesla, right? So these fields are in the millitesla range. Radio frequency pulses were in the microtesla range, and then the B0 field is in the tesla range. So there's huge range of magnetic field strengths that we use here. They're spatially varying. If I turn on a, a gradient, uh, it will have a, a different strength at different positions. It's stronger and stronger and stronger as you go further and further from isocenter. Uh, they're generally linear, and they add to the B0 field. And we'll see some pictures of this, but they only add to B0 in the Z direction. They're time varying. This is what makes scanners really loud. Uh, we, turn the, we turn the gradients on and off and on and off and on and off very quickly. Uh, and there are limits uh, in place by FDA as to how quickly we can switch magnetic fields. So we can measure gradients in gauss per centimeter. Uh, we could similarly measure gradients in millitesla per meter. Uh, again, there's just different units. And the slew rate maximum that we use is in terms of millitesla per meter per millisecond. Uh, the units there are probably important, and the number is probably important. Uh, because this is something FDA limits. If we switch the magnetic fields too quickly, we get peripheral nerve stimulation, and FDA 
uh, would prefer that we don't stimulate patients uh, very often, obviously. Uh, these are magnetic fields. These magnetic fields can add or subtract to the B0 field, uh, and they're parallel to B0. Uh, gradients in particular are not fields perpendicular to B0, and I'll show you what this looks like in a cartoon in a second here. So here's an example of the B0, uh, of, of, a, uh, of the magnet again, right? And here at the very beginning, we're referring to this as the isocenter. Uh, when no gradients are turned on, then we just have B0 at the head, the say midsection, and at the foot. So it's B0 everywhere. And the application of a, uh, sorry, and with regards to B0, this means that uh, the direction and magnitude of the magnetic field is uniform everywhere. And we would usually show that with an arrow. They all point along the Z, the Z direction, they all have the same amplitude. Uh, and as a consequence of having the same B0 field everywhere, then all of my spins will be processing at the same Larmor frequency, right? Everything's going to zip around at, say, 64 megahertz per Tesla. Now, something interesting happens when we add the presence of a magnetic field gradient. Magnetic field gradients, we saw these hardware components before. Just quickly, if I run current through a wire, I can generate a field, and I can run current in the opposite direction through a, a coil, say, at your feet relative to your head. And this allows me to increase the strength of the field at your head and maybe decrease the strength of the field at your feet. And the consequence is something like this. If I have a Z gradient and the Z direction points in the head foot direction, when I turn that Z gradient on, I can increase the magnetic field at the, say, head end of the scanner, and I can decrease the magnetic field at the foot end of the scanner. And now I have a magnetic field gradient, right? The gradient has given me a spatial variation in the magnetic field. And this is actually a really useful thing. Why? Well, now the Larmor frequency becomes spatially dependent, right? This is your first insight to how imaging could possibly work with MR. And so the idea is that I have a stronger magnetic field at the head, I have the nominal field in the, in the middle, and I have a slightly lower field at the foot. What's going to be different about the Larmor frequency uh, from top to bottom? Is the Larmor frequency up here going to be higher or lower? Higher, right? I have a stronger B0 field. And at the foot of the scanner, is it going to be higher or lower? lower because I have some opposing field, right? So that means now I have a distribution of Larmor frequencies, high frequencies at the head, lower frequencies at the foot. Now it's not immediately obvious why that might be especially useful, but this ends up being the key to spatial encoding. Magnetic field gradients cause a distribution, a linear distribution of the Larmor frequency. I can spread out the frequencies at which things are precessing. Uh, I don't just have Z gradients though, I also have X gradients. And so X gradients are typically the patient's left-right direction. And if I turn on those X gradients in the left-right direction, I can get different processional behavior on the left-hand side relative to the right-hand side, just like I did in the head-foot direction previously. So gradients actually give rise to isochromats. Isochromats were planes of common frequency. I can create isochromats, and that can be a very useful thing when it comes to spatial encoding. Uh, there are Y gradients as well, and so the Y gradients are usually the AP direction. And in the AP direction, I can cause spins to go more quickly or cause spins to go more slowly with the application of a, of a Y gradient. So here's a question. How would I get my magnetic field to have this particular shape? Everything's still pointed along Z but I have a really low field in the, in the left, say, and a quite high field in the right. Any ideas about how I could, could do that? My field's increasing from left to right, but my field's also increasing from foot to head. So I, I need multiple gradients, right? And so I can turn on, in this case, a Z gradient in green, and I can turn on the red gradient, which is my X gradient, and the combination of turning on both those gradients will uh, maybe decrease the field in this corner and really increase the field in this corner. So this is really interesting because now I have a so-called spin isochromat along this diagonal. That means that along this diagonal the magnetic field strength is the same. So spins along this line or along this plane will process at the same Larmor frequency. And if I have an RF pulse that is specific to this frequency, if it is specifically omega equals gamma B0, 
these will be the spins that I can excite. These spins up here have a higher magnetic field, they have a much higher Larmor frequency, and they won't see my RF pulse. They're higher frequency than my RF pulse. These spins down here are lower magnetic field, exposed to a lower magnetic field, have a lower radio, uh, have a lower um, Larmor frequency, and they also won't see my RF pulse. So my RF pulse, if it's tuned to gamma B0, can excite now these spins along this diagonal. By so by turning on a combination of, say, an X and a Z gradient, I can steer around where this plane is going to lie. And that's what underlies this idea that MR can acquire arbitrary imaging planes. I can turn on just my Z gradient and get some axial uh, slices, or I can turn on the combination of an X and a Z gradient and get these oblique slices. Uh, similarly, I could turn on an X and a Y gradient and get a, a, a different oblique image uh, through the same, uh, 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 through this subject as well. Okay, so we'll come back to spatial localization later, but that's your first insight as to how spatial localization might be possible with MR. I can turn on two gradients, have a plane of isochromats, and tune an RF pulse just to excite those spins uh, as one example. All right, so gradients are primarily used to make the B0 field more homogeneous. False, right? We'd use this specifically to make it inhomogeneous. Gradients are essential to spatial encoding. True, right? That's their main function. X and Y and Z gradients cannot be applied simultaneously. False, right? We just saw an example for oblique or double oblique scans. You'll use any combination of the gradients to, to get those uh, images. We'll, we'll get more into that when we talk about spatial localization. And then a, a handful of learning objectives. Okay, so quick summary of where, where we got today. So we know we have NMR active nuclei, hydrogen being the principal one we use for imaging. We know we need a B0 field as the polarizer for generating uh, available uh, uh, organized magnetization in the spin system. We know we need an RF system as the exciter. We have to put energy into the system at the right frequency to excite the spins. We know we need coils for receiving signals, right? We have specific coils, head coils, knee coils, whatever. We need to have a coil in place to receive that signal. And we need to use the gradients during all this to encode spatial information. And we saw our first ideas about how that could work for isolating a slice just a second ago. And then, of course, we'll talk more about this, but we need computers primarily for reconstructing the images. Okay, I know it's a ton of material. Uh, it's really hard to, to, to sort of give this good service in four lectures, but I'll do my best, and 